right? So we're at jordanwinslow.me slash classroom slash free tools. And if you're on the classroom website, you can just see the link right up here. You can click it. It'll take you to this page. Scroll down to synthesizers. The ones we're going to use for this lesson are digits 2, OBXD, click the effects, Protoverb, TDR Nova EQ, and Shattered Glass Audio Tube Preamp. These are the devices we're going to download. One, because they're 64-bit and 32-bit, so if you're operating in a 32-bit DAW, that's fine. If you're operating a 64-bit, which I recommend, then you will be able to download the 64-bit version. So let's get those installed. Um, Protoverb is an experimental research reverb by Yuhi, which is a company that I like the products of. This is a free reverb plugin. You can just click download for Windows or if you're on Mac, Mac OS. And uh, then we have the TDR Nova EQ, which it'll take you to this page here, tokyodon.net slash TDR Nova. This is a really good visual feedback equalizer um, that's free and you can use on any DAW. So I figured we'll go ahead and show that off. Uh, Extentofthejam.com is the digit 2. And we're going to use the Windows 64 slash 32 bit link over here, and that'll download the digit. And then lastly, on discodsp.com, you can download the OBXD right here. And those are the plugins that we're going to be using. And once you have them downloaded, um, where I'm just going to go through an installation right here and show you kind of how that works, just in case you need some help uh, with the installation yourself. So I'm going to install digits now, right click install as administrator, and then it doesn't default to the correct path for me right now. One, because I'm 64 bit DAW, and this is the 32 bit folder. I know it says times 86, but that means 32 bit if you're unfamiliar. Um, I'm going to install this in the C program files VST plugins folder that I already have and I'm gonna make a new folder in it called free and inside that folder we're gonna go ahead and install all these plugins so it's very important that you have a VST plugin folder and only one VST plugin folder on your computer and you can put folders inside of it and arrange your plugins inside that folder, but every single VST plugin should be in that in that folder. I, I even suggest installing the whole standalone applications in there too if you feel like doing that. You don't have to use the default paths. You can just install everything in that folder and it makes it a lot easier to manage down the line. So go I'm gonna go ahead and click install. It looks like it's already finished, so let's go ahead and extract the OBXD. Now I'm using just WinRAR, the free program, so I hit right click. Sorry about that, guys. My battery ran out right in the middle of installing, of course. So, um, where were we? We were installing the OBXD. So I extracted the folder right here, and I'm going to just double, actually, I'm going to right click it and hit run as administrator. Hit yes, and we're only gonna. I'm only gonna install the 64-bit version because I have a 64-bit DAW, which I recommend you do as well. For some uh, reason, you absolutely uh, cannot install a 64-bit DAW on your computer because your computer is 32-bit. Then go with the 32-bit version for now, but consider upgrading in the future. Um, your 64-bit folder, that's going to be the VST plugin folder again. So see how they keep trying to install it in all kinds of different places? You have to make sure that you manually, whenever you're installing these plugins, you always put it in the folder that you created called VST plugins or whatever you called it. And then if you want to put it in a subfolder like me, go ahead and do that as well. Okay, so it looks like that one's installed. Then we're going to do the amplifier SGA 
and once again it chose the wrong folder we are in program files VST plugins and the free folder <clears throat> okay and the last thing is the TDR Nova EQ so I extracted that by right clicking it and extracting files or extract here and then I'm just gonna double click or right click install as administrator and choose the correct folder again and now it's trying to make its own subfolder here I'm gonna delete that because I don't want it to make its own subfolder I want everything to be installed in the root of the free folder and then I'm going to tell it to only install the VS2, VST2 plugin. Um, now, if you're running a DAW that utilizes AAX plugins, you can use it, but uh, Ableton only uses VST. So I'm going to use the 64 bit VST. And I'm going to install it. Oh, so that was the program. We actually installed the program itself into this VST plugins folder. You don't have to do that. Um, you can install it anywhere you want on your computer. However, the VST plugin must be installed in the free or the uh, the VST plugin folder. And if you so choose, another folder called free, since all these plugins are free. Down the road, you may want to get paid plugins and not have them all mixed together. So right here it says selected components, 64-bit VS2 plugin, VST2 plugin. And as well as it's going to install the entire program itself in free because it looks like they have um, some standalone program for the TDR Nova which we will not be using but you guys might okay so now that all of that is installed you're going to want to open up your DAW And most modern DAWs scan for VST changes automatically, but just in case you had some issues with the tutorial that I gave, um, on Ableton and on most DAWs, there's a, either an option or a preference menu. You either go into preferences or options, and you're going to be looking for a file folder area where you can search for plugins. So plugin sources rescan plugins is what I'm gonna tell it to do and we're gonna make sure that we have a custom folder for our VST plugins and we can click browse and select that folder but for me it's C program files VST plugins and I just put literally every single plugin that I have inside that folder and no matter what program I'm using that utilizes those VST plugins it gets uh, recognized through that folder So now that it has scanned, we have a little folder here called free in our plugins area. So we click the plugins from the categories list. We go to free here and now we have all of this popped up. So I am using the Ableton Push 2 controller here, which just to give you a little bit of a visual while I'm working. And I'm going to be doing pretty much everything in here and uh, but you can see the screen as well so if I move the mouse around you're gonna see what I'm doing on screen so I'm gonna go ahead I've never used any of these plugins before we just I found them for you because they were free 64-bit plugins I'm gonna use them right now I'm gonna figure them out on the fly with you guys and I'm going to teach you how to make a hip-hop beat oh probably should show you how to do the drums huh so the last thing that you have to do is go to uh, the classroom free tools page and scroll down to you see this cymatics free sample packs we're gonna download a hip-hop sample pack and uh, so cymatics I'm not affiliated with them I don't really have any opinion yet because I haven't even used these samples myself but I noticed that they were uh, it's a, they're neatly organized they're doing everybody a service by allowing them to use them for free. Uh, it is kind of a hassle when you open this page because it does pop up with all this stuff. But that's, you know, to be expected. They, they need to make money too, you know. 
So they're probably going to pitch you different software or uh, different sample packs, things like that. And um, it's going to say download for free right here under the Hip Hop Starter Pack, give you some demos of what it sounds like, and they'll um, ask you to buy a more premium version. Now, you don't have to give them your email if you don't want. You can give them your name and email if you so choose, but if you just put in fake email, fake email at gmail.com, or just some email random like that, and hit download now, um, they still take you to the download page. So if you're not comfortable giving them your email, you can do that, but that's totally up to you. Maybe you want their recommendations for sample packs. Maybe you decide you like them. So anyway, download the Hip Hop Starter Pack right there, and there's your free download. So I also put that in my Ableton user library. So your Ableton user library, let me go ahead. No, it's different for everybody. That's the thing. It's hard to, when you first installed your, um, your DAW, you should have told it where your user library is. And let's see, we've got library and it'll say location of user library for Ableton here and we hit browse and for me I made a library section on the hard drive where I install all music libraries including the Ableton user libraries and what what I do is I I recommend installing all the samples you download now unless you're gonna go with multiple DAWs or if you don't have Ableton I would say go ahead and put them into the Ableton libraries slash uh, user library folder that way they're easier to locate especially if you're using something like the push hardware because now you can hit add device and we can go to user files user library samples and then i scroll to there's my free folder right there and then here's the cymatics hip-hop pack so i can listen to all the different uh, samples that i just downloaded uh, scrolling through here very easily so Make sure you inst you download and put your uh, samples into your Ableton user library if you want them to be really easily accessible. And I just put them in a folder called free Cymatics Hip Hop Pack. So as we collect more and more samples, um, we'll use that. So I'm not going to use any pitched samples like these 808s most likely. I noticed that they're pitched. You can tell because they say C, C sharp, G. Um, Instead, I'm going to see if we can generate one with one of the plugins we downloaded instead. But we are going to take a look at these loops and one shots. So let's see. Hopefully they have... Yeah, they've got snares, percussion kicks. So ton of stuff there. And we'll probably just end up using the fills. Or maybe we'll get lazy and we'll splice it. And uh, I'll, I'll show you a few different methods of making beats. So first, we're going to start off the hard way and we're going to build the beat completely from scratch just using one shots and uh, I recommend this to all uh, new producers because it's going to be the absolute best way for you to get experience and to figure all this stuff out so on Ableton we're going to go to our instruments and we're going to go to drum rack and we're going to go ahead and load that in so that we have a drum rack and on screen you can see that we have a bunch of pads and we've got this little thing right here that lets you select all kinds of different pads and what these letters and numbers are here are the notes on your keyboard so starting with A1 you know A sharp one to C1 up to C2 here so that's a full uh, chromatic octave of samples that you can load in. Basically every single one of these pads here are going to represent a sample which we will load with one of those one shots. And a one shot basically just means it's a sample that is a recording of one individual drum hit. Okay so if you don't have them automatically show up in your samples section on Ableton or in your user library section you can click the little add folder button and then you can just select the folder and it will add it right here. So that's what we're going to need to do so that we can see the samples. Alternatively, you can just open this folder in, uh, in another window and you can literally just go in and drag and drop your samples 
right onto the pad. Let's say it doesn't load the samples properly, try running it in administrator mode. And if you want the ease of use of just dragging and dropping the samples, you can load the sample in that way or you can load it in right over here. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna go to the drums, one shots, and we have a folder with kicks and we can click them to listen to the different ones. And I'm just gonna go with something basic. I like the, the F sharp kick and I like the grime kick. Well, we'll just do the grime kick for now, which I already have in there. And let's do some snares, of course. Ooh, that's a really good one. Okay, let's load that one in. Let's load this one in. Let's check out the claps. You guys can probably hear the rain outside. I'm gonna have some natural ambient rain added to the mix. So it's important to listen and audition. It's called auditioning. Uh, you want to listen to each sample and kind of imagine what you're going to be doing with it. So I want one with a little bit of a snap to it, and that one has kind of a snap. And I want one with a crunch to it, and that's more of this one. So now I have two snares, two claps, and a kick. And um, definitely want some cymbals in there, so let's get some closed hi-hats. And they're all pretty much the same. It's We might have to move them in and out to get one that we like. We might have to hear it playing an actual pattern. So we'll just put that in there for now. And let's see what we can come up with. Well, since we're gonna be doing something in hip hop, let's just start at, could do 70, 70 tempo, have it be a little bit faster. Or you could do 60. Alternatively, you can do, is it, Really no right or wrong tempo to put your music in, but um, hip hop is generally low t lower tempos. So I'm gonna go between 60 and 70. I'm just gonna start with 60 for now. And I'm gonna click the metronome button up here. And I'm going to, that way I can hear a beat every time I click play. And that way I have something to keep the beat with. And so there's, a, of course, if you have a live performance device, you can always just kind of play the drums in. Or, most likely, since you guys don't have that, we can just draw it in. So, we're going to double click this right here and we're gonna click the play button and then we're gonna to try to just make it go along with this beat. Right now we have a one bar loop it's set to one bar here. We can change it to four bars but for now let's just do one so we can hear it looping. So we'll have this little kick and right now it's very dead on. The rhythm is very dead on and that's because our grid is being aligned to 1 16th notes. If you right click on your grid down here, you can change your grid to be many different quantizations as they're called. And I'll explain that more later. Um, but this basically just automatically aligns it to these lines and the more lines obviously the more fine tune you can get. So I usually recommend doing the adaptive grid instead and just choosing narrow 
and that way when you zoom out it actually gives you more and more and when you I mean when you zoom in you get more and more and when you zoom out you get less so that adaptive grid is set to narrow and that helps me to kind of fine-tune and move these around so I'm gonna zoom out real quick I'm gonna to listen to it and I want it to be kind of off Okay, so now we have a basic kick and clap group going on. And this is always the foundation, kick and snare, kick and clap, or just kick. But one way or another, you have to lay down the absolute foundation first. And at this stage in creating your loop, you do not care what it sounds like in terms of quality you only care about the rhythms so do I like the rhythms or not and as you go you're going to fine-tune these samples using ADSR envelopes and effects and all kinds of little tricks to make those drums sound the way you want them to sound but at this first stage all we really care about is coming up with a rhythm that sounds good so that's a little slow, let's speed it up. Maybe a little too quick, we'll do 66. Okay, now let's add some hi-hats. So the way that I did this rhythm is... You're just gonna have to... <laughs> it's hard to explain why you do the rhythms that you do. Um, there's really no rule for coming up with something. It just has to sound good to you and you really just want to keep sliding these notes around until it sounds good to you. Or listen to a reference track on YouTube where you can kind of listen to the timings on their drums and then m manipulate your drums on the MIDI here to be what you think that sounds like on the piano roll. So use the piano roll to arrange MIDI to sound like a reference track or just create it from scratch based off what you think sounds good. And you want a narrow grid, but you don't want it too narrow. If it gets too narrow, it becomes very difficult to time these notes. In Ableton, you can see these big markers here where it says one, one, two, one, one, three, one, one, four because I've roughly split it into four sections in each of these little bars before it changes color. And so that's how you know where the downbeat happens. It happens here, 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 and here. So if you listen to the metronome, the metronome only plays on where, where these lines are, basically, where the gray columns change color. So you use those as guidance to say, okay, this is I want two kicks to happen before it gets to that second beat. And I'm gonna instead of doing the beat dead on like this, which doesn't sound very good for hip hop at all, uh, I adjust it to delay the kick a little bit. And this is a very common rhythm that's used in a lot of different beats so we may move it around as we go but I'm just showing you different tactics that you can use to create your drums from absolute scratch so that you can master this process and when it comes time to start splicing loops and things like that you're not just kind of jacking someone else's sound you you know how to create your own and you can edit it to be whatever you like so let's get a hi-hat groove in I'm gonna make the grid on narrow again so that 
it's easier for us to align it with these downbeats. And I'm going to play a hi-hat. I'm going to put one note here and I can either double click over and over or I can create some of them. I can right click and hit duplicate or control D on my computer and it will just duplicate those and then I can select them and duplicate it again and again and that way and now I have a hi-hat roll so let's see how that sounds. So it's a little bit quick obviously but we may keep the fast hats in the first part of it and then make it go a little bit slower. Okay, now I'm ready to make this loop a little bit longer. So I can either control A, select all, and then click the duplicate button, which will then duplicate the loop. I can do that and hit control D, does the same thing, and now I've duplicated the loop. Or I can go over here, the easiest way to do it if you're on Ableton is I have this one bar loop, I want it to be two bars, so I click duplicate loop, and now we have uh, a doubled loop. And so I want it to start off with this little hi-hat trill, but I don't want it to get too repetitive and keep doing that over and over again. So I'm going to take it away in the second part. And then I'm going to duplicate it again so that on the fourth bar we can alternate these hi-hats even more. So let's hear this. Okay, and that's a little bit, it needs a little bit more swing on the, on these high notes. So I'm going to zoom in here. Okay, now I have a basic little drum loop going. Nothing too fancy, and it uh, it's a little bit too aligned to the grid, so some of this could be moved around and, and given what's called swing. But now we're going to go into our plugins folder and into our free section, and we're going to go ahead and add that reverb, so protoverb, to our drum rack. So we added protoverb, and let's see what else do we want to add. Let's go ahead and add the SGA. Now nah, we'll leave the SGA off this, well, let's add the SGA and add the Nova. And so the order that we do this is actually quite important. So this is called a signal chain. And this is the order that the signal is being processed, the signal being these drums. So as I click the little yellow circles here to mute these effects, we have just our core drum loop. And we're going to want to process it with some tube distortion first, just we're going to do something really gentle, then we're going to want to add an EQ, and then we're going to want to do the protoverb. Alternatively, you could also do the EQ after the reverb so that you could shape the reverb itself. You have to think about where you want to put these plugins, and we'll talk about that more in the mixing phase, but um, you have to start thinking, do I want to 
just edit this sound and then have it go into the reverb, or do I want to edit the sound including the reverb with my EQ here? So let's go ahead and mute everything except the SGA 1566. And let's hear it off. Sounds like it may be adding just a tiny bit of, of bite to it. Um, I'm going to go ahead and change it to high CPU. We're going to leave it on stereo because we will be panning these drums eventually. And let's just start tuning these knobs and messing around. Oh, this reminds me, one thing you always, always, always do when you start a track is you go to your master channel and you go to your audio effects and you take a limiter and you drag it on to that master channel. You always want a limiter on your master channel. Doesn't matter what the ceiling is at really, you can have it at zero or uh, 0.30, negative 0.30, you can keep lowering it, but I would keep the ceiling you know, just slightly below zero have a six millisecond look ahead and have the release be set to to negligible. Well, actually, we can turn the release up a little bit. What this does is it makes sure that we don't harm or send any harmful signals to our speakers and potentially damage them because anything that exceeds zero dB here on this zero marker, this is the volume marker for the master channel where all your audio is getting sent including this drum rack so this master is the final point of where this audio travels and then before it gets to your speakers so we want to make sure we have a limiter there which says I'm gonna put a wall and this audio can't reach past that wall it just hits it and it stops so no audio will go above that 0 dB and therefore uh, nothing will be distorted and everything will be clean and healthy for your speakers by the time it gets there. So let's go ahead and keep editing our sound. Okay, so it appears the best settings that we can do here is to raise the bass up a little bit past five, raise the EQ up a little bit for the treble past five here, and uh, leave all of this alone. Leave it on high CPU, not low CPU. Leave the oversampling at one, leave it on stereo. And this just adds a tiny little bit of a bass and treble boost by uh, literally amplifying the signal of these drum hits. So let's listen to it without and then with. Now it may be hard to tell because I am recording it right now. I'll let you hear in the end what the final product sounds like by uh, recording the whole thing and letting you hear it nice and clean. But because I'm using a camera to record the audio right now, you're just hearing the audio come out of my speakers, so it's not going to sound as bassy as it does right in front of me here, but you'll hear it later. So just trust me when I say we've basically added bass to it, and if you're following along, uh, you'll see that yourself. So we added treble and bass with the amplifier, that's what this is, and now we're going to shape the sound a little bit. Actually, I'm just going to add some reverb. Let's start with the protoverb. So on here, this is a kind of a strange reverb. It's not like other ones because it's completely randomized and they sometimes you get some really good results, sometimes not. So what you do is this signal here is your dry signal, which means that is my drums by themselves with no reverb. So do I want none of my drums? Of course not, I want all my drums, so I'm going to leave that at 100% of my drums will be heard. And then I want a little bit of reverb added. So we're going to put it at 20, we're going to listen. And now as we adjust the decay, it makes that reverb last longer. Now you want as much of a dry signal as possible to sound clear, so I'm going to have to lower the volume of this actual channel 
called drum rack, our drum rack, we're going to lower the volume so that as we introduce more and more of this wet signal, we're not exceeding the zero dB threshold of this volume and therefore we don't add any distortion or muddy up our mix by making everything too loud. This gives me a little bit of headroom is what it's called, so I'm giving myself headroom. And now let's go ahead and randomize and see, we'll, we'll randomize the model. Because this is a randomizer, these are the settings for the decay, the dry, and the wet that I ended up with. And you can enter in these letters and numbers by double clicking here. You can enter them in and hit OK and it should give you the same sound I have. And we're going for subtlety here. We don't want to add a ton of reverb. We just want it to sound more lifelike. So without, it's very dry. With, just sounds a little bit more lifelike, a little bit more realistic. So we're just slowly adding more and more realism to our drums. We'll get more in depth on this process when we get to the mixing section of the class. But for now, this is just a basic idea of how you're going to be putting effects in series to make things sound more and more realistic as you go. So now I have my EQ in the last section of the chain here and I can click and drag it if I wanted to move it around. And what I wanna do is I wanna cut everything that's below 20 hertz completely off. And I wanna do that with by making it not a bell shape, but a cut off shape. We're gonna take it to 20 and we're gonna cut it off and uh, we're going to adjust the Q here. We're going to raise that way up till it's about flat at 50. And what this is doing is it's cutting off everything that the human ear can't hear anyway, and it is cleaning up the mix just a little teeny tiny bit. And uh, then I may boost just a tiny bit of this sub frequency here. This is where the kicks happen. We'll get more into that in the mixing section, but this is just some basic stuff, okay? We're not gonna get too in-depth here. I'm gonna do it at about 100 because it's a hip-hop kick. If it was dance music, I might go lower, you know, between 50 and 100, but between 100 and 200 is more where the hip-hop kicks are gonna be happening. And um, I'm gonna add a little bit around 1K. I'm gonna adjust the Q, and what the Q does is it makes the shape more pointed and specific so I'm going to put it at about right here. And this is just to add a tiny bit of higher volume for the clap and the snare. So let's see if we can get some visual feedback going on here because this was supposed to be a visual. There we go. So out is the signal that's going to be coming out of this EQ. In would be the signal before it's being processed, so I would see a visual down here of what it looked like with no EQing, but I want to see what's happening as I'm EQing it. So let's take a look at the audio. So you can see how the bass gets higher and higher as you raise the EQ over here. This is three, six, nine, twelve decibels that we are adding in gain, which means we're basically just raising the amplitude or amplifying or raising the volume of the frequency 100 right here. So this is the gain that we're raising it by. This is the frequency that we're raising and up here you can see the hats, you can see them happening on here. So we're gonna cut off some of the hats uh, high frequency so that it's not so sharp sounding. Okay, now let's hear a before and after. 
So with no effects, and with some basic effects. So obviously you can get even more and more nitty gritty, even more professional. You can start using much higher end plugins than these and start really digging in on these sounds. But for now, since you're just learning, get comfortable with all of these different knobs and what they do. Understand what a uh, amplifier is. Uh, understand what a reverb is and understand what EQing is. You don't have to be an expert in EQing. You don't have to memorize that the, the kicks happen at around 100. You know, you don't have to know that, oh, three decibels gain on around 100 on the kick is good for hip hop or, or anything like that. You, we'll get to that when we get to the mixing portion of the class. But for now, just have an idea of, of how all these plugins operate and know how they can boost the, the quality of your, your drums. So now that we have some drums going and they sound relatively decent, I'm not going to try to make you a, a studio hit right now. I'm not going to try to make the best hip hop track in existence. So let's just go to plugins and um, we're going to start with the digits, the digits VST. Keep in mind, I've never used any of these before. I'm literally, I'm new to all of these samples, all of these effects, except for protoverb. I've used that before. Um, so I'm doing this right right here with you guys, figuring it out right with you. So digits is, it looks like a two oscillator synthesizer. So we have two oscillators here, and it's, we've got some shapes. <laughs> Angry and angrier is our shape. Um, and then it looks like we have some filtering. We've got uh, our ADSR, which is going to be very important. See how the sustain is all the way up? to make you be able to hear it. And uh, we might, we'll see if they have any uh, presets. It looks like they do have some presets on here. So let's experiment. So because I'm using the Ableton Push, I'm just gonna cheat and I'm gonna choose, uh, I guess, just for kicks, we'll do something easy. Let's do the most common key and ever Let's use the most common key for pop music and just go with G major for right now. And what I've done is now every single pad on my Ableton push is G major only. So if I open up the piano roll, you guys can see that here. So you can see that I'm only playing in G major. So there's our G. a bass with this so I'm gonna go down to C or this is G1 that's where it seems to get low and um, I'm gonna start demoing some of their bases because I'm not teaching you sound design right this second but I, I'll give you some general ideas so let's check out their bases Okay, that's good enough. And now I'm going to start editing the sound. Well, that sounds decent. I do have to tell you that saw and square waveforms aren't the best for bass. So let's check out the OBXD real quick and see if it has any better options for, for bass because I kind of want something that's going to be a little bit more rumbly and that's what sine is going to accomplish for us. Looks like we're just stuck with saw waves, huh? Okay, no, sine only for the LFO. Well, well, I guess we'll stick with what we had here with the digits then. So what I've got is the digits demo bank and then I choose bases, and then I choose sub. And then I 
I didn't really change much on here. So we'll use that for base and let's see what we got going on here. So I'm going to start by creating a little MIDI pattern here. And I'm going to raise the loop length to four so I have more room. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to automate the first part of this sub to kind of filter in aggressively. So to do that, I want some decay. And then I don't want the sustain to be maxed out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to automate the pitch of this bass so that it starts off at a higher pitch and very quickly goes down to the lower pitch that it's at. So let's try that out. I want to affect the pitch, so I'm going to hit the MIDI control. Pitch bend should be the first thing to pop up most times. Again, I got there by clicking this little window here. It says show, high, show hide envelopes. And I'm going to, at the very beginning of this sound, for just a split second, I want it to be a much higher pitch. Okay, so we have this parameter here called Porta Speed, which is the same thing as Glide in this example. So what I've done is I've made a higher pitched G note two octaves above the G note that the bass is playing. And what I'm doing is I'm having it, because it's set to mono, monophonic, it's only going to play one note at a time. So when I try to play two notes, it's going to play the higher note. And then, it's go when this note ends, it's going to immediately go to the lower pitch. But, if I raise this porta, or the glide, up, now, whenever I play this note, it's going to start at the higher pitch, and then bend down to the lower pitch, so that we get this really cool bass effect like this. All right, let's try that out. Okay, it's a little too high, so I'm gonna lower it. So usually with this kind of music, you want your bass notes to time up with the kicks. So we have these kicks, and if you want to make it easier for yourself, you can select the kicks that you've drawn and copy them by right-clicking. Actually, you can't right-click to copy these bad boys. You have to go up to the Edit menu and hit Copy, or you can select them all and just hold Control-C, should be familiar to you and you can copy and paste them into your actual bass melody here to show you when those kicks are happening which means you want your notes to time up with these so now I can just kinda of drag these over and I know instantly that if I put a little space between them they're gonna time up perfectly with the kicks that I've put in So let's just do that, and then we'll control D, duplicate that. 
And then we'll delete these, of course, because we don't want to accidentally play those notes. And now let's hear. Okay, so I've added just some basic modulations to the, just some basic changes to the MIDI notes here of our bass melody. And so every time one of these high notes play, it's going to do a, a really quick pitch drop. And up here it's going to do an even higher pitch drop. So here's what it sounds like all in action. And we could have probably done something even cooler than that, but you know, for just freestyling a melody out real quick, that's not too bad of a start. Uh, those are some techniques that you can use in hip hop of any style. And of course you can change the basses around. You can, you don't have to use that sub. There's all different kinds of uh, basses on here that you could try out, or you can try to create your own by adjusting these wave shapes and adjusting the skew of them and um, you can even put it in poly but not for a bass line you don't want you never want to play more than one note at a time for a bass line so now we have our two most important elements of any beat especially in hip-hop but in all music in general really is driven by the rhythm is determined by the drums and the bass that is what the rhythm is determined by in universally every track ever made in human existence except for tracks that just don't even have drums or bass for some reason so we have our drums we have our bass we can start renaming them right click them and uh, hip hop drum loop we can call it we can widen this so we can see it better this we can just call low bass it's a good habit to get into. You can even change the color of them. Red can be bass. You know, these blue colors can be drums or black could be drums. And you know, you can just kind of make it whatever you want to remind you, hey, this is my drums are gray, my basses are, are orange, and my leads are blue, maybe, you know? And uh, now we're going to go ahead and create a little lead to go with it, with the OBXD. So I'm going to click the record button here, which lets me control it with my Ableton Push MIDI controller. And we're just going to kind of experiment with this. Um, I'm going to start off by just holding down this pad and then I'm gonna make some changes and we're gonna see what we what we can come up with. Okay, so I'm going to go through a very simple 1357875 arpeggio on this. And I'm going to, after I have that, those MIDI notes recorded, I am then going to start switching instruments and hear what instrument sounds best with that melody playing. So let's go ahead and enable the metronome again to help me record this. And I'm just going to play it live in. Okay, so I've got that recorded on the screen now, and I'm going to quantize that. And I'm going to quantize it to 1 16th notes. Okay, and 
then let's there we go so very simple there and I'm gonna start messing with this uh, sound now and see if we can come up with something interesting if not I'm gonna switch to a different instrument Okay, so I don't like the OB XD that much because it's um, somewhat limiting. We may use it in future productions. For now, I'm gonna pull up the Tyrell M6 and see if there's anything on there that we can come up with that's interesting. Okay, so this sounds cool. We have a cool little pad that we've made very easily by just playing a one, three, five, seven, eight, seven, five, three. So the first note, third note, fifth note, seventh note, eighth note, seventh note, fifth note, third note, and then back to the key note of G major. So we're just going through the scale run of G major, but we've added the seventh. And that's all we're doing is very simple patterns that we've learned in the melody portion of our course. And I just put it on a on the preset PWM Filla, and it is a filler in that regard because it's going to be a, an excellent background ambience to help fill out this track. And I just by listening to it, I can already tell that it we can come up with some interesting effects if we add a uh, amplifier to it. So we are going to add. The amplifier that we downloaded to it and what I'm going to do also is I'm going to put the TDR Nova before the amplifier in the effect chain because I want to EQ out the bass on this synth because we already have some some very high bass so I'm going to click this cutoff and this time I'm going to cut it off even higher I'm going to raise the Q up so that it's a sharper cutoff and I'm going to do it around uh, 200 or so And that way, that way we cut off a lot of the bass and it doesn't compete with our bass line at all. So I'm cutting it off at about 500. Okay, and then I'm going to pull up the amplifier and we're going to mess around with this sound now. Okay, so we've got some really cool effects coming by cutting off the low end of this pad and then adding the tube amplifier to it. And what I'm doing is I'm lowering the bass even more, raising the treble, and then I've just absolutely raised the gain to the highest possibility and then lowered the output as much as possible. And the reason I've done this is to distort the signal as much as I can to produce some unique effects without blowing out our eardrums. We do have to lower the output because that's going to be the volume that gets sent to the master channel here and gets starts competing with our drum loop. So we don't want to only hear the pad. And that's what's going to happen if we have the output too high when we have this gain. Because for the gain, we are literally raising it by 10 decibels. So I'm lowering it by another like 9 and what's happening is it is now distorting the signal and then lowering it in volume so that it's not too loud. So we achieve that distortion effect while not having a very loud um, sound. And now it sounds very mystical and distorted and unique. 
And that's going to fit really well with our drum loop as a accompaniment in the background. And you know what, let's just to go all out, let's go ahead and add that reverb to it as well. We'll add our protoverb. So now we have our protoverb added and let's start messing around with that. And what you want to do when you're experimenting with reverbs sometimes, especially when you're getting experimental with it, is you want to lower the dry value as much as possible and raise the wet value. So just have it only be able to hear the reverb for the most part. That way you can kind of model and shape the reverb to be however you want it to sound. Okay, so that widens it out a lot. So I'm, you can just copy this and use that and you'll get this exact effect. Okay, and then what, from there we would probably add some sort of lead or a hip hop vocal or maybe some just filler effects like little voices, voice recordings, things like that to fill out this groove. But for now, you know how to put in a drum rack, fill it with drum samples either by dragging them in from an external folder or by doing it through a folder in your DAW. And you've learned that you can amplify the signal just a little bit on the drums only, only a little bit. Because the drums you want to treat very carefully, you don't want to distort them. They want You want them to sound pretty clean unless you're going for a style like that includes distortion in that style. For the bass, we, went, we wanted a sine bass, but we ended up with a saw-shaped bass and it says the basis wave here was cosine, which is basically, it's sine, upside down. So it looks like um, it starts off with a sine wave and then we model it with these saws. So we have a pretty clean sine wave base. It's, it's mainly just a pure sine, almost. And then we've got our pad, which is the Tyrell N6 playing PWM Phila and we've added, we've cut off all the low end on it because we don't want it to compete with our bases and we've amplified it a ton and then added some reverb to it.